I'm Grant Holofont, and this is We Can Be. Remember promises from 10 years ago of hundreds of thousands of natural gas jobs in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia? Elected leaders called fracking an economic game changer. Economic impact studies said drilling companies would hire tens of thousands of local workers. And all the gas being produced would mean the creation of more companies in the region and tens of thousands more local jobs. Plus, property owners would get rich from natural gas royalties. They said money from all these new jobs and royalties would flow into local stores, restaurants, and businesses. And those businesses would hire even more workers. Local communities would thrive and prosper. But what really happened? With the beauty and grandeur of the Appalachian Mountains also comes a battle over its resources, playing out most notably over the past several decades with the advancement of shale hydraulic fracturing, more commonly known as fracking. Today's guest knows both the area and the subject well. Sean O'Leary was born and raised in West Virginia and is a senior researcher and writer with the Ohio River Valley Institute. The Institute was founded in 2020 with an aim of providing sound research for a more sustainable, equitable, democratic, and prosperous Appalachia. Prior to joining the Institute, Sean served as communications director at the Northwest Energy Coalition in Seattle, Washington. He is a playwright whose work has been performed around the country, and he is the author of Pound, which ran off-Broadway with Christopher Lloyd in the title role of writer Ezra Pound. For much of the past decade, Sean has focused his considerable research and writing skill on the energy industry. His recent work zeroes in on the role of coal, natural gas, and petrochemical industries in the economies of Appalachia. His book, a newspaper column and blog, all titled The State of My State, have been widely shared and cited, and have captured the attention of the U.S. Department of Energy, where Sean was asked to present earlier this year. He is that rare bird who both knows data inside and out and communicates it well. Sean O'Leary, welcome to We Can Be. Well, thank you for having me. You're a writer and a researcher who has prospered in a multitude of media platforms. Actually, I'm kind of impressed. One review of your book, The State of My State, said this about you, quote, Sean O'Leary explores with insight, passion, humor, and more than a little love, the seemingly endless challenges that bedevil his home state of West Virginia. To give our listeners some idea of why you write with such passion about this part of the world, I'd love for you to start out by sharing with us what are the things you love most about West Virginia and this region. West Virginia is, for me, and and, and always will be, regardless of where I live, it will always be home. My passion for it is shaped in large part by the fact that, you know, I was born in the mid-1950s at a time when the Ohio Valley, Wheeling, West Virginia, where I'm from, was still near its zenith Mm. as a steel community, much like the Monongahela Valley in Pennsylvania. And almost from the moment of my birth, Wheeling has been in economic decline. At the time I was born, it had a population of nearly 60,000 people. Today, it's less than 30,000. And that demise coincided with the drop-off of the steel industry. We know what's happened with the coal industry. And with that, it created a situation where I and most of the people of my generation had to hit the hillbilly highway to find work. And I think the fact that for many of us, leaving the valley wasn't so much a choice as it was a necessity, almost inevitably creates a sense of nostalgia, not just for what was, but for what, at least in our minds, I might have been. And I think that's still what drives me. McDowell County was once the backbone where power was concerned. We just don't have the people here that we once had. We're like the backyard 
of the nation is Southern West Virginia. Your front yard's for looks. You got your pretty flowers and your pretty bushes, and you know, that's what you want people to see. You don't want them to see your backyard because that's where your dog house and your hoe and your shovel and all that, but that's because back air's where the work gets done. I don't believe that uh, it'll ever be like it was when I was a kid. I really don't believe that, or in my lifetime anyway, when coal was uh, king. You go from 100,000 people down to 22,000 people. Now when I look down the street in Welch, you don't see anybody. It's almost like a ghost town. That doesn't make me love this place any less. With the incredible landscape of the Appalachian Mountains also comes a battle over its resources, playing out most notably over the past several decades with the advancement of shale hydraulic fracturing, more commonly known as fracking. This involves injecting a liquid chemical mixture at high pressure into subterranean rocks in order to force open existing fissures and extract oil and gas. When and how did you first become aware of what is now known as fracking? Fracking really came onto the scene in the late 2000s, 2007, 2008, is really the dawn of the fracking boom in Appalachia. I was already pretty intimately involved through the newspaper column that I was writing at the time with the economics of coal. And fracking first showed up on my radar screen primarily because it was obvious to me that it would be a serious threat to the coal industry. Mm -hmm. And of course, West Virginia has long identified itself culturally as well as economically as being a coal state, the coal state. And at the time, one of the disconnects that I noted was that, of course, many political leaders in the state were very supportive and almost giddy at the prospect of the coming natural gas boom in the state. And it was as though they were sleepwalking into a buzzsaw because it was quite apparent that to the degree that the natural gas boom did take place, that it would largely come at the expense of the coal industry, which was a fact that virtually no one was acknowledging. When you wrote about this in a recent piece called Destined to Fail, Why the Appalachian Natural Gas Boom Failed to Deliver Jobs and Prosperity and What It Teaches Us, you saw that coming for the area of the world that you describe in the article as fracalatia. And how did you have a sense that that wasn't going to pan out in the way that it was predicted? The economics of natural gas make it structurally incapable of producing significant job growth or increases in prosperity. There's actually an economist at Bucknell University, a fellow named Thomas Kinneman, who in even greater detail than I did saw this coming. What Kinneman pointed out in 2010 was that the natural gas industry is an incredibly capital-intensive industry. It's not a very labor-intensive industry. And so when you hear talk of billions and billions of dollars being invested in a county or in a region to extract gas, it sounds incredibly impressive. Mm. And then when you think about the sales of gas and all the revenue associated with that, but as Kinnaman suggested might happen, only a tiny, tiny fraction of the money that's invested or the money that's earned actually lands in local economies. In the report that you referenced a minute ago, one of the things that we did was go into the fate of that money. In other words, how can you invest? And at this point, it's over $200 billion in Appalachia. How can you invest that much money and have so little happen? Where did the money go? Where are all the leakage points that cause so little of that money to actually enter local economies? 22 counties that you track in the report trailed the nation in key measures of economic prosperity, including growth in jobs, personal income, population, despite the fact during this period that economic output grew at three times faster than that of the nation. Mm -hmm. Why does that not translate into jobs? Why is the outcome for 22 counties that they actually fall farther behind? Yeah, well, Grant, what you just put your finger on and what you're describing is sometimes referred to as the resource curse. There are multiple reasons which I tend to think of 
as almost holes in the bucket through which money leaks out of the region. When companies come into a region to do drilling, by and large, they bring in workers and suppliers of services from out of state. And that's because Appalachia does not have a heritage of doing natural gas or oil drilling. However, the Gulf Coast does. That's leakage point one. Leakage point number two is that natural gas extraction is one of the least labor-intensive activities in our economy. To put it in context, when you look economy-wide, usually about 60 cents of every dollar that you spend goes to pay for someone's work, someone's labor. In the natural gas industry, that number is as low as nine cents for every dollar. Hmm. There weren't that many jobs created in the first place, and many of those that were created went to out-of-state workers. That means that there's less money going into the economy, less money being spent on groceries and movies and all of those other things. You know, when we hear about economic impact studies, such as those that were done in anticipation of the natural gas boom, there are a series of assumptions that go into that. And among those were the price of gas. And so another big source of revenue was supposed to be royalties that local property owners would receive. The amount of revenue that was generated from the sale of natural gas was less than half than was originally anticipated in those reports. The economic impact models upon which policymakers based their outlandish optimism were based on assumptions about the value of gas and how much money it would actually generate. And it turned out to be literally less than half of what was assumed. So now I'm counting at least four holes in the economic bucket. We start with the fact that there aren't as many jobs being created as were expected. The second is that the jobs that are being created are being filled by mostly people from other places. The third is that as a result, there's less of a cascade effect in terms of other economic activity being generated. And then the fourth is that the value of the gas itself was significantly less than than had been forecast. Any others? Oh, yeah, we're not done yet. For folks who received royalties, the royalties not only weren't as big as would have been expected based upon the original economic impact studies and those assumptions. But it turns out that the people who got the money did not do with it what was expected. The most famous of the economic impact studies included an interesting assumption, and that was that the people who received royalties would spend all of the money that they received in royalties within a year of receiving it. Hmm. And that, of course, stimulates downstream economic activity. But it turns out that people actually spend less than half. And many of them, frankly, spent it outside of the region. You know, if you buy a new vacation house in Myrtle Beach, (laughs) that doesn't do much to help your local economy. You also have to take into account that in many cases, the property owners who received the royalties are not local residents. The best estimate of property ownership in West Virginia, real estate ownership, suggests that only about 25% of the real estate in West Virginia is owned by local residents. Good grief. You know, imagine what that means for the distribution of royalties and stuff. Is there any argument to be made from the other side that, hey, you don't know what would have taken the place of this extractive work and what the income levels would be absent this industry? The the best way in which to analyze that is to look at the surrounding counties mm-hmm. and similarly constituted counties that did not have a huge natural gas boom. Two of the eight Pennsylvania counties that are really major gas producing counties are Washington and Greene County. Washington County looks a whole lot demographically and economically like Butler County, and they both grew at about the same rate, except Butler County did not have a big natural gas boom. Similarly with Greene County, if you look around at Fayette County and Westmoreland County, which again did not see a major boom in natural gas, 
you nonetheless see basically the same jobs performance. And that's true in Ohio, and it's true in West Virginia, too. Another indicator of this is population, isn't it? I mean, I think your findings track closely with the data from the most recent census. And the same counties that you're describing continue to suffer a loss of population, despite, again, supposedly benefiting from the promise of these jobs. Yeah, that's true. At the time we released the report in February of this year, the census data was not out. But yes, since it has come out, it has confirmed the same pattern of population loss throughout these counties. And that is, in many ways, probably the most bewildering statistic, because when you see population loss, what you're seeing is a decline in the labor pool you're seeing a loss of talent. Mm -hmm. And when you're concerned about turning economies around and trying to get them back into a mode of job and economic growth, the loss of talent, the loss of your labor pool is a huge hurdle to overcome. The talent pool in many cases is what employers first look at when they decide whether or not to locate and or consider a community is a place to do business. Well, and for communities that are suffering decline, as Pittsburgh experienced in the 70s and 80s and worked really hard over the course of decades to reverse this, it's very hard to rebuild your labor pool when you've lost it. And it's taken us a long time in order to do that. Well, and because we've gone through the opioid crisis, the meth crisis, Mm -hmm. we've gone through some crises that are doing even greater damage to the labor pool, and it's creating some truly anomalous results and some fairly discouraging ones. One of the peculiar responses to the first report that we did on Frackalacha, when we looked at these issues of jobs and income and population, was that some people argued, people representing the gas industry in particular, argued, well, wait, how can that be? because the unemployment rate has been going down in these Mm -hmm. counties. And that's true. But what you have to keep in mind is there are two ways to reduce your unemployment rate. The way that most of us assume that the unemployment rate is reduced is that you add jobs. But there is another way to reduce your unemployment rate, and that is to lower Mm -hmm. the number of people in the labor pool. And the unemployment rate went down in the 22 Frackalachian counties for precisely that reason. It's not that they added jobs. It's that they lost workers and they lost people even faster than they lost jobs. And yet the jobs and prosperity linkage still continues to be a dominant feature of the conversation around extraction in this part of the world. Why is that mythology around the boom that resources will bring so persistent here. What you're putting your finger on now is part of what first inspired me to start writing. One of the issues that I struggled with was the gap, the discrepancy between the rhetoric that we often heard from leaders citing statistics like the one I just mentioned about Mm. declining unemployment rates and the reality that could be seen on the ground. All you have to do is walk through downtown Bel Air, Ohio, or Wheeling, West Virginia, or Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, and you can see that there is not an economic boom going on there. You can Mm. see that there are no jobs. You see the vacant storefronts, you see the vacant lots, you see the unpaved streets, and you could tell you didn't have to be an economist to know. Nonetheless, people heard on a regular basis the rhetoric about an economic game changer, and thousands of jobs being created. That message was thoroughly internalized, and it's still one of the greatest challenges we face as a community. If you're from many of the counties we're talking about, whether it's southeastern Ohio or southwest Pennsylvania, you have been taught throughout your life, in many cases, that fossil fuels, natural gas, coal, are the source of wealth and prosperity to whatever degree it exists where you live. 
And it is a mindset that is intensely difficult to shake. You know, one of the most soul-crunching things for me in, in doing this work, you know, I promise you, you can walk into any restaurant in Wheeling or Bel Air or places like that and find a dozen people who will say to you, I really wish my kids, when they're grown up and they have their families, that they could stay here, but I hope they don't. <laughs> wow. You know, what's the difference between the wish and the hope? It's that at the end of the day, you care more about your kids and your grandchildren's well-being than you do about what might personally bring you joy. And the fact that people have to make that trade-off or see the need to make that trade-off tells you everything about what's going on. That's incredibly powerful, that choice that folks are having to make and expressing in that wish. Love your formulation of it, the wish versus the hope. Um, you know, one aspect of that is not economics. It's also about health and quality of life. And you, uh, in the summer of 2021, presented to the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management to outline some of the environmental and public health impacts of natural gas and petrochemical extraction can you tell us a little bit about what you shared with them? There is serious damage that's being done to people's health and well-being. Deaths on the order of anywhere between about 1,200 to 4,600 a year throughout the region. And it's a quality of life issue that, yes, can be measured in lives and in healthcare dollars and in a variety of measures like that. But it also can be measured in the way in which it discourages businesses and families from wanting to locate in the region as well. One of the economists who we work with on a regular basis at the Ohio River Valley Institute is Amanda Weinstein from the University of Akron. So I studied urban and regional economics, which is really thinking locally, it could be your local town, your local city, your region, Northeast Ohio, a state, really what makes those places grow and succeed? What makes the people in those places succeed? I think we are at a place where we need to be favorable to, to thinking about doing things differently. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be open to taking risks and to thinking big ideas, whether that's big ideas on infrastructure or education. Mm -hmm. But now I think we need to actually think inward. Mm -hmm. So now if you look at who gets jobs, those jobs are going to goods and services that actually service the local area. Amanda has done probably the most research of anyone in the nation into the question of what are the measures that can be taken from a policy perspective to help small communities, small cities thrive economically. And she recently released a report in which she compared quantitatively the effect of measures that are designed to improve the business environment, meaning mm -hmm. typically things like subsidies, reduced taxes, and reduced regulation, or on the other hand, measures that improve quality of life, whether it's education, recreation, all of those things that we think of as making our lives more enjoyable, more fun, more rewarding. And what she found in a survey of over, I believe, 150 different micropolitan areas was that overwhelmingly quality of life measures are far more effective at generating economic growth and job growth than business environment measures. Hmm. And what that suggests is that when you look at the damage that's being done, whether it's from air pollution from burning coal or whether it's from dust and noise pollution and traffic and road damage that's being done by the fracking industry, these things take a toll on business opportunities. The Ohio River Valley Institute was founded in 2020 to provide communities and decision makers with the policy research and practical tools they need to advance long-term solutions to Appalachia's most significant challenges from an economic perspective. But the question that those communities and decision makers eventually arrive at inevitably is, 
So if it's not this, if it's not extraction, what's the alternative? And I know the Institute was created in part to help answer that question, but what is the answer? What sort of information are you leading them toward so that they can think differently about this? Well, I just mentioned a moment ago the work done by Amanda Weinstein, in which she looked at quality of life measures. And so we actually took that work and went looking for communities whose characteristics were comparable to those of many of the communities we're talking about in these Appalachian counties. And I landed on a community called Centralia, Washington. Mm -hmm. Centralia, Washington is a coal town. And frankly, if you were to parachute in from western Pennsylvania or eastern Ohio, you'd look around and you'd feel pretty much at home. The town's largest employer for decades was a coal mine that in 2006 closed, causing the town to lose 600 jobs. Its second largest employer is a coal-fired power plant that is in the process of closing. Our prosperity depends on our willingness now to move forward with a clean energy future. In 2011, then-Governor Chris Gregoire signed the bill calling for the closure of the only coal-burning plant in the state. And today, nine years later, at 341 this afternoon, unit number one was shut down. The impact of these layoffs will be felt by many more than just the employees and their families. The schools and public projects are all going to miss out on all the tax dollars that have been generated by their jobs here for decades. In Centralia, Drew Mickelson, King 5 News. But something happened there that was quite unusual. The owner of the power plant was prevailed upon by the state of Washington to set up an economic transition fund. And the company kicked in $55 million in funding, which the transition grant board is handing out in the form of grants to individuals, to businesses, to you know municipalities and local governments. And since the grant program began in 2016, Centralia has added jobs at twice the rate of the U.S. economy. Wow. Lewis County, Washington had 24,000 jobs before. In the four years after the grant started, the community added 2,800 new jobs. And to your point, this is coming from investments in quality of life. Yes. There are three primary areas of investment that are being made. One of them is in education. And much of it, by the way, is what we would traditionally classify as vocational education. Mm -hmm. Another area is energy efficiency. And the third area is clean energy, you know, distributed generation from solar panels and things like that. So we looked at Centralia. We saw these incredible economic statistics coming out. And we asked, how come? I mean, because frankly, when you look at the $55 million in grants being handed out, that is a pittance compared to the billions of dollars being invested in these counties to produce natural gas. And we discovered a whole series of things that I think not coincidentally happens to align very closely with Amanda Weinstein's research. When you invest in energy efficiency, you know, new doors and windows or insulating your house, The people who do that work are usually local contractors. Mm -hmm. You're not bringing in anything from out of state. These are local people who do the work. The second thing that happens is that when you make grants like that, usually the business owners or homeowners kick in some of their own money. You may get through a grant two or three thousand dollars toward the purchase of a new high efficiency heat pump. The homeowner will kick in another, you know, 10,000 of their own money to do it. And the reason they do it is because the payback makes sense. The return on investment all of a sudden got to be very good, whether it's in the form of lower utility bills or whether it's in the form of the value you can get if you decide to sell your house or your building or your business. And so it frees up more money coming into the economy. The third thing is that it improves the quality of life. You end up with a building or a house that's 
warmer, safer, more comfortable. And you also end up with one that has lower utility bills. Those lower utility bills translate into more disposable income. So virtually all of the leakage points that we were talking about a little while ago with respect to the natural gas boom are plugged because it creates growth from within the existing economy for these communities. That is the most sustainable kind of growth that we have. When I started at Mountain View Solar, I was placed on the installation crew and I was very green to anything construction related, anything electrical. I started basically out of high school and within about a year, I was, uh, I was able to run a crew and go out to jobs. You know, we, we did it from start to finish. Um, under my supervision. It's a very engaging job as well. Um, and for me, that stuck out. This job in particular is, is very easy to pick up. Um, and something that, you know, if you're already in that trade mindset, that, that blue collar nine to five, then you'll enjoy being in this atmosphere as well. Because that's, that's what we are. Particularly with clean energy, everybody in West Virginia often starts to clutch onto the things that they know we're really looking down the barrel, and I, I think it's time that we start working towards creating new infrastructure that can renew itself within seconds and uh, maintain itself through you know, years and years to come. We're at an interesting inflection point in this part of the country right now in that rather suddenly there is a an awareness that climate change is real and that people are are wanting to see change and that markets are beginning to demand change uh, with respect to resource use and extraction and climate impact. But there are risks in an area where the prevailing orthodoxy is still around the resource curse. And I'm wondering if you can just share with us your thoughts on what we need to be careful about. One of the challenges that we have is that we're either going to embrace the clean energy transition to which you referred as a region, or we risk being trampled by it. I mean, we, we've already seen the movie once. We went through the 1970s and 80s and saw the collapse of the steel industry. Right now, the greatest risk that we face is that we'll continue to dig our heels in in opposition to a transition that is inevitable, not just for policy reasons, not just for climate change reasons, but the fact is that clean energy is just plain cheaper than energy from coal and even from natural gas. And there is nothing from a policy perspective that will change that. And so it means that as a region, the question that we face is, are we going to embrace this transition as they did in Centralia and benefit from it? Or are we going to dig in our heels and try to resist it? We talk about and we hear the phrase just transition used quite frequently. We've heard it used particularly heavily in the context of the Green New Deal. Just transition, frankly, exists more as a concept or even as a sentiment than it does as a policy or a strategy. You know, a few minutes ago, Grant, you you know raised the question, what's the alternative? That is exactly the question that I am confronted with often from county commissioners, economic development folks in these counties. And if I don't have an answer to that question then it's kind of all for naught. Right. I'm curious what keeps you doing this work? What drives you to continue researching and writing about this part of the world and the challenges faced by communities like the ones all around us? Oh, because I'm an optimist. This can be better. We can do something about this. It is a situation that can be fixed. For me, one of the values that I hope I bring to this discussion and that I hope Orvi is bringing to it is the recognition that just hammering people in Western Pennsylvania and in the greater Ohio Valley over the head with the evils of fossil fuels is not in itself enough. It's not going to win them over, nor should it. 
because there are jobs and there are communities that do depend on these industries and they do need an alternative. Frankly, for the most part, as a, an environmental community, we haven't done a great job of really answering that question. Mm-hmm. We imagine sometimes that we're enlightening people by saying to them, do you realize that you're causing rates of asthma to go up? Do you realize that you're causing, do you realize? And the answer is, hell yes, they do. These are people who are accustomed to making a remarkable trade-off. They understand that when you go into the mines, you're going to be killed, either quickly, whether it's in a collapse or an explosion, or slowly through black lung or something like it. People do it knowing that there are nasty health consequences. But they do it because it is the way in which they can best provide for their families. And certainly I'm trying to address those very human and understandable needs that people have in a way that threats of global warming and other consequences simply don't by themselves achieve. I think this is such a profound point, and I appreciate the clarity with which you lay it on the table. And it illustrates to me why banal phrases like just transition don't carry the day in the absence of specifics. And I think our our movement has to address that question. Well, and, the, and, and there are trade-offs. I mean, we have to be honest with people. I mean, the fact is, one of the standard objections you run into when I raise the Centralia model is, yes, but when we talk about losing, whether it's coal mining jobs or power plant jobs, we're talking about losing the best you know, blue-collar jobs we have, the highest-paying blue-collar jobs. Right, what do you, right. And you know what? That's absolutely true. And I promise you, there are lots of people in Centralia, Washington, who worked in the mine, who worked in the power plant, who now have lower paying jobs. There are trade-offs. What I can tell you, though, is that the jobs that are happening in Centralia are really good paying jobs for the most part. In addition to outstripping the nation for job creation and for population growth, Average wages in Centralia are also rising 50% faster than they are in the nation as a whole. I think it's important to touch on this because I'm thinking about a generation that is coming into consciousness at a time of constant crisis where, you know, it really does feel today as though we're facing one existential crisis after another, a crisis in democracy obviously the existential threat about climate change, threats around public health, and it's hard to be an optimist right now. You said you were an optimist. Why are you an optimist? Because at least within the narrow scope of the issues with which I'm concerned at Orvi, which Mm -hmm. have to do with energy transition, the environment, and especially economic development and recovery, those problems are fixable. There are resources to do it. There is a strategy that is proven to do it. And one other thing that we should mention that we should talk about is that the message from the various reports is getting an audience, and it's getting an audience in some surprising places. Mike Belding, who is the chairman of the Green County Commission, who is a Republican, Mm -hmm. joined us for the launch of the Centralia and the Destined to Fail reports. Hmm. And Green County is one of the 22 Frackalachian counties. A Republican commissioner and a Republican majority council have embraced the Centralia model and are now working in that direction. I don't go in talking to them about the evils of fracking or making it a pro-industry or anti-industry thing. I simply am able to go into them on the basis of the original Frackalacha report and then Destined to Fail and just point out, you're getting a really bad deal. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're pro-industry or anti-industry or pro-fracking or anti-fracking. The fact is, you know, you're just getting a really bad deal. And that is a message around which people seem to be able to coalesce. 
But I think what's hopeful about that is, you know, we live in these incredibly partisan times where everything is politicized. And yet that shouldn't be a political issue or a partisan issue, the desire to not get a raw deal and have my community survive. Yeah, these guys have to balance budgets. They have to pay for schools. They have to do a lot of things. And that does cut at a level that goes way below ideology. It's a, a much more fundamental consideration. And I really am encouraged by how willing people are. Not always. I mean, some have <laughs> some some will not speak to me. I mean, some will speak to me and say really nasty things. But I've I've actually been in Greene County, Marshall County, Belmont County, Ohio. These are all places where people have decided, yeah, we'd really like to talk about this. Sean, the name of this program is We Can Be, and I always like to wrap up by asking for you to complete that sentence. We can be what? We can be brave. What we're talking about is asking people to set aside generationally old preconceptions of what works, what constitutes success, how do we create prosperity? How do we improve our quality of life? And look at the facts in the remorseless light of dawn. Mm. <laughs> and that's not an easy thing to do. Bill Parcells, the old football coach, used to say, you are what your record says you are. Right. We're more than 10 years. We're more than a decade into the fracking boom. It has a record. The industry is what its record says it is. And so... There is an opportunity to set aside those kinds of ideological or political preconceptions and say, let's just deal with it as it is. Sean clearly cares about the Appalachian region he grew up in, and there's so much of what he said that shows that. One thing that particularly struck me is the battle he has heard regarding wish and hope. He said parents and grandparents are faced with that choice every day, saying, when my kids are grown and have families of their own, I wish they could stay here, but I hope they don't. Sean said, at the end of the day, you care more about your kids and your grandchildren's well-being than you do about what might personally bring you joy. He believes that the very fact that people see the need to make that trade-off tells you everything about what's going on. For me, that is a reminder that behind all the data, the reports on health and the promised economic booms that never come, are people, individual human beings, their families and their loved ones. It is their long-term quality of life that should be the focus. And Sean is addressing that too by offering an alternative that seems to be working. What is playing out in Centralia, Washington, is hopeful in that it shows that there may be another way, a way where focused investments in basic quality of life elements appear to be having a real impact on health, job security, and economic stability. Sean is digging deep, sharing often uncomfortable truths and offering hope for a better way. And we are grateful to him and all who are working to build an Appalachia where no family has to make the choice between wish and hope. 